My mama, reported Morris Mogolsky, choosing a quiet moment during a writing period to engage his teacher's attention. My mama likes you shall come on mine house for see her. Very well, dear, answered Miss Bailey with a patience born of many such messages from the parents of her small charges. I think I shall have time to go this afternoon. My mama, Morris began again, she says I shall tell you skews how she don't send you no letter. She couldn't to send no letter the while her eyes ain't healthy. I am sorry to hear that, said teacher with a little stab of regret for her prompt acceptance of Mrs. Mogolowski's invitation, for of all the ailments which the children shared so generously with their teacher, Miss Bailey had learned to dread most the many and painful disorders of the eye. She knew, however, that Mrs. Mogolowski was not one of those who utter unnecessary cries for help, being in this regard, as in many others, a striking contrast to the majority of parents with whom Miss Bailey came in contact. To begin with, Mrs. Mogolowski had but one child her precious, only Morris. In addition to this singularity she was thrifty and neat, intensely self-respecting and independent of spirit, and astonishingly outspoken of mind. She neither shared nor understood the gregarious spirit which bound her neighbors together and is the lubricant which makes east side crowding possible without bloodshed. No groups of chattering, gesticulating matrons ever congregated in her Monroe Street apartment. No love of gossip ever held her on street corners or on steps. She nourished few friendships and fewer acquaintanceships, and she welcomed no haphazard visitor. Her hospitalities were as serious as her manner, her invitations as deliberate as her slow English speech. And Miss Bailey, as she and the first readers followed the order of studies laid down for them, found herself again and again, trying to imagine what the days would be to Mrs. Mogolowski if her keen, Shrewd eyes were to be darkened and useless. At three o'clock she set out with Morris, leaving the board of monitors 78 to 1 to set room 18 to rights with no more direct supervision than an occasional look and word from the stout Miss Blake, whose kingdom lay just across the hall. And as she hurried through the early cold of a November afternoon, her forebodings grew so lugubrious that she was almost relieved at last to learn that Mrs. Mogolowski's complaint was a slow-forming cataract, and her supplication, that Miss Bailey would keep a watchful eye upon Morris while his mother was at the hospital undergoing treatment and operation. But of course, Miss Bailey agreed, I shall be delighted to do what I can, Mrs. Mogolowski, though it seems to me that one of the neighbor's neighbors, snorted the matron, what you think the neighbors make MIT mine little boy? They got four, five dozens children's theirselves. They ain't got no time for look on Morris. They come maybe in mine house UND break mine dishes, UND rubber on what is here, UND set by mine furniture UND talks. What do they know over talking care on mine house? They ain't ladies. 
they is educated only on the front. Me. I was raised private und expensive in Russia. I was ladies. Unduist ladies. Uist krisht 79 to 1 that is too bad but that makes me nothings. I wants you shall look on Morris. But I can't come here and take care of him, Miss Bailey pointed out. You see that for yourself, don't you, Mrs. Mogolowski? I am sorry as I can be about your eyes, and I hope with all my heart that the operation will be successful. But I shouldn't have time to come here and take care of things. That ain't how mine mama means, Morris explained. He was leaning against teacher and stroking her muff as he spoke. Mine mama means the money. That is what I means, said Mrs. Mogolowski, nodding her ponderous head until her quite incredible wig slipped back and forth upon it. Morris needs he shall have money. He could to fix the house so good like I can. He don't needs no neighbors rubberin. He could to buy what he needs on the store. But ten cents a day he needs. His papa works by Harlem. He is got fine jobs, und he gets fine monies but he couldn't to come down here for take care of Morris. U.N.D. the doctor he says I shall go now on the hospital. U.N.D. anyway, she added sadly, I ain't no good, I couldn't to see things. He says I shall lay in the hospital three weeks. Maybe that is twenty-one days U.N.D. for Morris it is two dollars U.N.D. ten cents. I got the money. And she fumbled for her purse in various hiding places about her ample person. And you want me to be banker, cried Miss Bailey, to keep the money and give Morris ten cents a day is that it? Sure answered Mrs. Mogolowski. It's a awful lot of money, grieved Morris. Ten cents a day is a awful lot of money for one boy. No, no, my golden one, cried his mother. It is but right that thou shouldst have plenty of money, you and thy teacher, a Christian lady. Though honest und what neighbor is honest, will give thee ten cents every morning. Behold, I pay the rent before I go, und with the rent paid und with ten cents a day thou wilt live like a landlord. Yes, yes, Morris broke in, evidently repeating some familiar warning. UND every day I will say mine prayers UND wash me the face, UND keep the neighbors out, UND on Thursdays UND on Sundays I shall go on the hospital for see you. And on Saturdays, broke in Miss Bailey, you will come to my house and spend the day with me. He's too little. Mrs. Mogolowski, to go to the synagogue alone. That could be awful nice, breathed Morris. I likes I shall go on your house. I am lovin' much MIT your dog. How? snorted his mother. Dogs. Dogs ain't nothing but foolishness. They eat something fierce, und they don't works. That iss how mine mama thinks, 
Morris hastened to explain, lest the sensitive feelings of his lady paramount should suffer. But mine mama she never seen your dog. He iss a awful nice dog, I am lovin much mit him. I don't needs I shall see him, said Mrs. Mogolski, somewhat tartly. I seen, already, lots from dogs. Don't you go make no foolishness mit him. Don't you go you and he get chawed off of him. Of course, of course not, Miss Bailey hastened to assure her, he will only play with Rover if I should be busy or unable to take him out with me. He'll be safer at my house than he would be on the streets, and you wouldn't expect him to stay in the house all day. After more parley and many warnings the arrangement was completed. Miss Bailey was entrusted with two dollars and ten cents, and the censorship of Morris. A day or so later Mrs. Mogolski retired, indomitable, to her darkened room in the hospital, and the neighbors were inexorably shut out of her apartment. All their offers of help, all their proffers of advice were politely refused by Morris, all their questions and visits politely dodged. And every morning Miss Bailey handed her monitor of the goldfish bowl his princely stipend, adding to it from time to time some fruit or other uncontaminated food for Morris was religiously the strictest of the strict, and could have given cards and spades to many a minor rabbi 82 to 1 on the intricacies of kosher law. The Saturday after his mother's departure Morris spent in the enlivening companionship of the antiquated rover, a collie who no longer roved farther than his own backyard and who accepted Morris's frank admiration with a noble condescension and a few rheumatic gambles. Miss Bailey's mother was also hospitable, and her sister did what she could to amuse the quaint little child with the big eyes, the soft voice, and the pretty foreign manners. But Morris preferred Rover to any of them except perhaps the cook, who allowed him to prepare a luncheon for himself after his own little rites. Everything had seemed so pleasant and so successful that Miss Bailey looked upon a repetition of this visit as a matter of course, and was greatly surprised on the succeeding Friday afternoon when the monitor of the goldfish bowl said that he intended to spend the next day at home. Oh, no, she remonstrated, you mustn't stay at home. I'm going to take you out to the park and we are going to have all kinds of fun. Wouldn't you rather go and see the lions and the elephants with me than stay at home all by yourself? For some space Morris was a prey to silence, then he managed by a consuming effort. I ain't by myself. Has your father come home? said teacher. No, ma'am. And surely it's not a neighbor. You remember what your mother said about the neighbors, how you were not to let them in. It ain't neighbors, said Morris. Then who, began Miss Bailey. Morris raised his eyes to hers, his beautiful, black, pleading eyes praying for the understanding and the sympathy which had never failed him yet. It's a friend, he answered. 
Nathan Spiderwitz? she asked. Morris shook his head, and gave teacher to understand that the monitor of the window boxes came under the ban of neighbor. Well, who is it, dearest? she asked again. Is it anyone that I know? No, ma'am. None of the boys in the school. No, ma'am. Have you known him long? No, ma'am. Does your mother know him? Oh, teacher, no, ma'am. Mine mama don't know him. Well, where did you meet him? Teacher, on the curb. Over yesterday on the night, Morris began, seeing that explanation was inevitable, I lays on mine bed, und I thinks how mine mama has got a sickness, und how mine papa is by Harlem, und how I ain't got nobody beside of me. und, teacher. It makes me cold in mine heart. So I couldn't to lay no more, so I puts me on MIT mine clothes some more, und I goes by the street, the while peoples is there, und I needs I shall see peoples. So I sets by the curb. Und mine heart it go und it goes so I couldn't to feel how it go in mine inside. Und I thinks on my mama, how I seen her mit bandages on the face, und mine heart it goes some more. Und, teacher, Mrs. Bailey, I cries over it. Of course you did. Honey, said teacher, putting her arm about him. Poor, little, lonely chap. Of course you cried. Teacher, yes, ma'am, it ain't for boys they shall cry, but I cries over it. Und soon something touches me by mine side. Und I turns und mine friend he was sitting by side of me. Und he don't say nothings, teacher, no, ma'am, he don't say nothings, only he looks on me, und in his eyes stands tears. So that makes me better in mine heart, und I don't cries no more. I sets und looks on mine friend, und mine friend he sets und looks on me mit smillin looks. So I goes by mine house, und mine friend he comes by mine house, too, und I lays by mine bed, und mine friend he lays by mine side. Und all times in that night sooner I open mine eyes und thinks on how mine mama is got a sickness, und mine papa is by Harlem, mine friend he is by mine side, und I don't cries. I don't cries never no more the whiles mine friend is by me. Und I couldn't to go on your house tomorrow the whiles I don't know if mine friend likes Rover. Of course he'd like him, cried Miss Bailey. Rover would play with him just as he plays with you. No, ma'am, Morris maintained, mine friend is too little for play MIT Rover. Is he such a little fellow? Yes, ma'am, awful little. And has he been with you ever since the day before yesterday? 
Teacher? Yes, ma'am. Does he seem to be happy and all right? Teacher? Yes, ma'am. But, asked Miss Bailey, suddenly practical, what does the poor little fellow eat? Of course ten cents would buy a lot of food for one boy, but not so very much for two. Teacher, no, ma'am, says Morris, it ain't so very much. Well, then, said Miss Bailey, suppose I give you twenty cents a day as long as a little strange friend is with you. That could to be awful nice, Morris agreed, U.N.D., Mrs. Bailey, he went on, sooner you don't needs all yours lunch mine friend could eat it, maybe. Oh, I'm so sorry, she cried, it's ham today. That don't make nothings M.I.T. mine friend, said Morris. He likes ham. Now, Morris, said Miss Bailey very gravely, as all the meanings of this announcement spread themselves before her, this is a very serious thing. You know how your mother feels about strangers, and you know how she feels about Christians. And what will she say to you and what will she say to me when she hears that a strange little Christian is living with you? Of course, dearie, I know it's nice for you to have company, and I know that you must be dreadfully lonely in the long evenings, but I'm afraid your mother will not be pleased to think of your having somebody to stay with you. Wouldn't you rather come to my house and live there all the time until your mother is better? You know, she added as a crowning inducement, Rover is there. But Morris betrayed no enthusiasm. I guess, said he, I ain't lovin' so awful much M.I.T. Rover. He is too big. I am Lee Keen Little Dog's M.I.T. Brown Eyes, what walks by their legs U.N.D. carries things by their mouths. Did you ever see dogs like that? In the circus, answered teacher. Where did you see them? A boy by our block, answered Morris, is got one. He is lovin' much M.I.T. that dog U.N.D. that dog is lovin' much M.I.T. him. Well, now, perhaps you could teach Rover to walk on his hind legs, and carry things in his mouth, suggested teacher, and as for this new little Christian friend of yours. I don't know be he a Christ. Morris admitted with reluctant candor, he ain't said nothing over it to me. Ania Irish lady what lives by our house, she says mine friend is a Irisher. Very well, dear, then of course he's a Christian, Miss Bailey assured him, and I shan't interfere with you tomorrow you may stay at home and play with him. But we can't let it go on, you know. This kind of thing never would do when your mother comes back from the hospital. She might not want your friend in the house. Have you thought of that at all, Morris? You must make your friend understand it. I tells him, Morris promised, I don't know can he understand. He's pretty little, only that's how I tells him all times. Then tell him once again, 
Honey, Miss Bailey advised, and make him understand that he must go back to his own people as soon as your mother is well. Where are his own people? I can't understand how anyone so little could be wandering about with no one to take care of him. Teacher, I'm talking care of him, Morris pointed out. All that night and all the succeeding day Miss Bailey's imagination reverted again and again to the two little ones keeping house in Mrs. Mogolowski's immaculate apartment. Even increasing blindness had not been allowed to interfere with sweeping and scrubbing and dusting, and when teacher thought of that patient matron, as she lay in her hospital cot trusting so securely to her Christian friend's guardianship of her son and home, she fretted herself into feeling that it was her duty to go down to Monroe Street and investigate. There was at first no sound when, after climbing endless stairs, she came to Mrs. Mogolowski's door. But as the thumping of the heart and the singing in her ears abetted somewhat, she detected Morris's familiar treble. Bread, it said, iss awful healthy for you, only you dasn't eat it out to win. I never in my world seen how you eats. Although the words were admonitory, they lost all didactic effect by the wealth of love and tenderness which sang in the voice. There was a note of happiness in it, too, a throb of pure enjoyment quite foreign to teacher's knowledge of this sad-eyed little charge of hers. She rested against the door frame and Morris went on I guess you don't know what ISS polite. You shall better come on the school, you and Miss Bailey could to learn you what ISS polite and healthy for you. No, you couldn't to have no meat. No, sir. No, ma'am. You couldn't to have no meat till I cuts it for you. You could to, maybe, make yourself a sickness you and a bashfulness. Miss Bailey put her hand on the door and it yielded noiselessly to her touch, and revealed to her guardian eyes her ward and his little friend. They were seated vis a vis eighty nine to one at the table. Everything was very neat and clean and most properly set out. A little lamp was burning clearly. Morris's hair was parted for about an inch back from his forehead and sleeked wetly down upon his brow. The guest had evidently undergone similar preparation for the meal. Each had a napkin tied around his neck and as teacher watched them, Morris carefully prepared his guest's dinner, while the guest, an Irish terrier, with quick eyes and one down-flopped ear, accepted his admonishings with a good-natured grace, and watched him with an adoring and confiding eye. The guest was first to detect the stranger's presence. He seized a piece of bread in his teeth, jumped to the ground, and walking up to teacher on his hind legs, hospitably dropped the refreshment at her feet. Oh! Teacher! Teacher! cried Morris, half in dismay at discovery and half in joy that this so sure confidant should share his secret and appreciate his friend. Oh! Teacher! Mrs. Bailey! This is the friend what I was telling you over. 
See how he walks on his feet. See how he has got smellin' looks. See how he carries some things by his teeth. All times he makes like that. Rover, he don't carries nothing s. You and gold fishes, they ain't got no feet even. Ani is he could to make them things. Oh, is his name Izzy? asked Miss Bailey, grasping at this conversational straw and shaking the paw which the stranger was presenting to her. And this is the friend you told me about? You let me think, she chided, with as much severity as Morris had shown to his Izzy, that he was a boy. I had a fraid, said the monitor of the goldfish bowl frankly. So had teacher as she reviewed the situation from Mrs. Mogolowski's chair of state, and watched the friends at supper. It was a revelation of solicitude on one side, and patient gratitude on the other. Morris ate hardly anything and was soon at teacher's knee Izzy was in her lap discussing ways and means. He refused to entertain any plan which would separate him immediately from Izzy, but he was at last brought to see the sweet reasonableness of preparing his mother's mind by degrees to accept another member to the family. U.N.D. he eats. His protector was forced to admit he eats something fierce, Mrs. Bailey, as much like a man he eats. U.N.D. my mama, I don't know what she will say. She won't leave me I shall keep him, from long I had a little bit of a dog, U.N.D. she wouldn't to leave me I should keep him. U.N.D. he didn't eat so much like Izzy eats, neither. And I can't very well keep him, said Miss Bailey sadly, because, you see, there is Rover. Rover mightn't like it. But there is one thing I can do, I'll keep him for a few days when your mother comes back, and then we'll see. You and I, if we can persuade her to let you have him always. She wouldn't never to do it, said Morris sadly. That other dog, didn't I told you how he didn't eat so much like Izzy, and she wouldn't to let me have him? That's a cinch. Oh. Don't say that word, dear cried teacher. And we can only try. We'll do our very, very best. This guilty secret had a very dampening effect upon the joy with which Morris watched for his mother's recovery. Upon the day set for her return, he was a miserable battlefield of love and duty. Early in the morning Izzy had been transferred to Miss Bailey's yard. Rover was chained to his house, Izzy was tied to the wall at a safe distance from him, and they proceeded to make the day hideous for the whole neighborhood. Morris remained at home to greet his mother, received her encomiums, cooked the dinner, and set out for afternoon school with a heavy heart and a heavier conscience. Nothing had occurred in those first hours to show any change in Mrs. Mogolowski's opinion of home pets, rather she seemed, in contrast to the mild and sympathetic Miss Bailey, more than ever dictatorial and dogmatic. At a quarter after three, the goldfish having received perfunctory attention, 
and the board of monitors being left again to do their worst, unguarded, Morris and teacher set out to prepare Mrs. Mogolowski's mind for the adoption of Izzy. They found it very difficult. Mrs. Mogolowski, restored of vision, was so hospitable, so festive in her elephantine manner, so loquacious and so self-congratulatory, that it was difficult to insert even the tiniest conversational wedge into the structure of her monologue. Finally Miss Bailey managed to catch her attention upon financial matters. You gave me, she said, two dollars and ten cents, and Morris has managed so beautifully that he has not used it all and has five cents to return to you. He's a very wonderful little boy, Mrs. Mogolowski, she added, smiling at her favorite to give him courage. He iss a good boy, Mrs. Mogolowski admitted. Don't you get lonesome sometimes by yourself here, hey? Well said Miss Bailey, he wasn't always alone. No, queried the matron with a divided attention. She was looking for her purse, in which she wished to stow Morris's surplus. No, said teacher, I was here once or twice. And then a little friend of his. Friend? The mother repeated with a glare, was friends here in mine house? Miss Bailey began a purposely vague reply, but Mrs. Mogolowski was not listening to her. She had searched the pockets of the gown she wore, then various other hiding places in the region of its waistline then a large bag of mattress covering which she wore under her skirt. Ever hurriedly and more hurriedly she repeated this performance two or three times, and then proceeded to shake and wring the outdoor clothing which she had worn that morning. God! She broke out at last. Mine God! Mine God! It don't stands. And she began to peer about the floor with eyes not yet quite adjusted. Morris easily recognized the symptoms. She's lost her pocketbook, he told Miss Bailey. Yes, I lost it, wailed Mrs. Mogolowski, and then the whole party participated in the search. Over and under the furniture, the carpets, the bed, the stove, over and under everything in the apartment went Mrs. Mogolowski and Morris. All the joy of homecoming and of well-being was darkened and blotted out by this new calamity. And Mrs. Mogolowski beat her breast and tore her hair and Constance Bailey almost wept in sympathy. But the pocketbook was gone, absolutely gone, though Mrs. Mogolowski called heaven and earth to witness that she had had it in her hand when she came in. Another month's rent was due, the money to pay it was in the pocketbook. Mr. Mogolowski had visited his wife on Sunday, and had given her all his earnings as some salve to the pain of her eyes. Eviction, starvation, every kind of terror and disaster were thrown into Mrs. Mogolowski's wailing, and Morris proved an able second to his mother. Miss Bailey was doing frantic bookkeeping in her charitable mind, and was wondering how much of the loss she might replace. 
she was about to suggest as a last resort that a search should be made of the dark and crannied stairs, where a purse, if the fates were very, very kind, might lie undiscovered for hours, when a dull scratching made itself heard through the general lamentation. It came from a point far down on the panel of the door, and the same horrible conviction seized upon Morris and upon Miss Bailey at the same moment. Mrs. Mogolowski in her frantic round had approached the door for the one hundredth time, and with eyes and mind far removed from what she was doing, she turned the handle and entered Izzy beautifully erect upon his hind legs, with a yard or two of rope trailing behind him, and a pocket book fast in his teeth. Blank, pure surprise took Mrs. Mogolowski for its own. She staggered back into a chair, fortunately of heavy architecture, and stared at the apparition before her. Izzy came daintily in, sniffed at Morris, sniffed at Miss Bailey, sniffed at Mrs. Mogolowski's ample skirts, identified her as the owner of the pocket book, laid it at her feet, and extended a paw to be shaken. Mein Gott, said Mrs. Mogolowski, what for a dog iss that? She counted her wealth, shook Izzy's paw, and then stooped forward, gathered him into her large embrace, and cried like a baby. Mine got! Mine got! She wailed again, and although she spent five minutes in apparent effort to evolve another and more suitable remark, her research met with no greater success than the addition. He ain't a dog at all, he iss friends. Miss Bailey had been sent to an eminently good college, and had been instructed long and hard in psychology, so that she knew the psychologic moment when she met it. She now arose with congratulations and farewells. Mrs. Mogolowski arose also with Izzy still in her arms. She lavished endearments upon him and caresses upon his short black nose, and Izzy received them all with enthusiastic gratitude. And I think, said Miss Bailey in parting, that you had better let that dog come with me. He seems a nice enough little thing, quiet, gentle, and very intelligent. He can live in the yard with Rover. Morris turned his large eyes from one to another of his rulers, and Izzy, also good at psychologic moments, stretched out a pointed pink tongue and licked Mrs. Mogolowski's cheek. This dog, said that lady majestically, iss mine. Nobody couldn't never to have him. When I was in mine trouble, was it man's or was it lady's what takes you and he gives me mine money back? No. Was it neighbors? No. Was it you, Miss Teacher, mine friend? No. It was that dog. Here he stays MIT me. Morris, my golden one, you wouldn't to have no feelings about mama having dogs? You wouldn't to have mads. No, ma'am, responded her obedient son, Mrs. Bailey she says it's fur boys they should make all things what is love in MIT cats und dogs und horses. 
good, said his mother, I guess, maybe, that ain't such a foolishness. It was not until nearly bedtime that Mrs. Mogolsky reverted to that part of Miss Bailey's conversation immediately preceding the discovery of the loss of the purse. So oh oh, my golden one, she began, lying back in her chair with Izzy on her lap so oh oh, you had friends by the house when Mama was by hospital. Ani won, Morris answered faintly. Well, I ain't scolding, said his mother. Where I ss your friend? I likes I shall look on him. Ain't he comin' round tonight? No ma'am, answered Morris, settling himself at her side and laying his head close to his friend. He couldn't to go out by nights the while he gets adopted off of a lady. Read more at www.kidsgen.com web link.